Thank Jesus Christ for being a lighthouse. Jesus is also king. Let's say that a few times together. Jesus is king. Two more times. Jesus is king. Last time, Jesus is king. All right, take your Bibles now that we're charged up and ready to go and uh, turn to Genesis, the 14th chapter, Genesis 14, as you do. Remember, God the Father loves you and wishes to teach you something through the investigation of his word this morning. It is a privilege to be with you here on uh, Mother's Day, and uh, we're grateful for all of our mothers that are here, uh, uh, biological, adoptive, spiritual mothers, everything in between, all of our ladies, we are grateful for you, and uh, we've got some pins, if you haven't already, ladies, if you haven't seen a pin, we've got some some pins with your name on it just for you, okay? So uh, I think the ushers will have those at the end of service if you want to grab one of those on the way out. I've got one right here. It actually writes w- really well, and it just says Village Baptist OKC okay, has our address and our website on it, but it's got this pretty little color here. I don't even know what that is. My wife makes fun of me for being colorblind. I, fuchsia, is that what that would be? I don't know. Pink and red, I don't know. Okay, all right. Someone, will, I'm sure someone will correct me at the end of the service. But you make sure you get a, a pen before you walk out, ladies, and we are grateful for you. I've titled our message today, A Tale of Two Kings. A Tale of Two Kings. We have seen that there is this one true God. We know him by the personal name Yahweh. That name, that personal name Yahweh, was to separate Yahweh from every other pagan god of the ancient world. Did you know there's also pagan gods that are still worshipped today? All right, And we need to tell people about Yahweh. Yahweh, generally, in the Bible, if you look at some of the uh, exegesis of the Old and the New Testament, um, often the name Yahweh is synonymous with the second person of the Trinity. Not always, but most of the time, if you see Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, that generally refers to the second person of the Trinity who took on flesh, your king, my king, This one that we know as Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about a tale of two kings today. But we've seen here in this Vistas, Christ in all the Old Testament series, we have seen the plan and the purpose of God. And by the way, the more I prayed about it, I had kind of mapped out some kind of some some key texts all throughout the Old Testament. And the more I prayed about it, there's enough for us here in Genesis to kind of really focus on the book of Genesis for a good long while. And then we'll, we'll step back and we'll either, I'm praying, either we're going to deal with the book of Galatians or we're going to get through the book of Romans. At some point, people keep asking me about the book of Revelation. By the way, two things that grate on the ears of all pastors and all preachers, if you refer to the book of Revelation, singular, as the book of Revelations, Plural. Don't do that. We will tar and feather you on the way out, okay? Another thing that grates on the ears of all preachers and pastors, and when we hear people refer to human beings who have died and gone to heaven as angels, okay? We have learned that we are of a different genus and category. We are a different creature. We are not angels. We don't become angels. I know this probably bursts your bubble a little bit. If you die and you go to heaven today, you will not have angels' wings, okay? That will not be part of your heavenly body and you should say amen to that okay but we are are grateful to be here in the word today and we're going to systematically walk through the book of genesis we're going to kind of hit those high points then we'll go back to the new testament that will that'll be something that we have to look forward to but one of the things that we've seen here in the book of genesis this one true god this creator god this god who is the one who is sovereign over all all powerful omnipotent and literally has the power to speak the very universe into existence by the power of his speech. That's how powerful he is. He's also this incredibly intimate and sweet and tender God, forgiving us. And we see again and again this kind of, uh, kind of schema, if you will, this, kind of, uh, this, this facet in the scriptures. It's really not only in the Old Testament, it's all in the New Testament as well. We see God blessing his people. We see the people of God messing it up and sinning. And then God demonstrates his graciousness. It happens over and over and over in the biblical text. And if you and I are honest, if we're honest about our own spiritual walk, we would acknowledge that God has blessed us. We sin and he is continually grateful and gracious uh, in the way that he deals for us. We should be grateful grateful towards him. He's gracious towards us. We should be grateful for the way that he deals 
with us. Last week, we dealt with this issue of family and being faithful in favoring your family. We want to end all the strife. We know that there will be conflicts here and there, but we want the, the strife of not only our biological families, but we want the strife in our spiritual family here at Village Baptist OKC. We want the, the strife in the other families of God here in Oklahoma City and beyond. We want that strife to end because that, that strife hinders us. And so we are to call to, to fight for our family, not against our family. We see it in the life of Abram. Abram was the elder of Lot. He actually could have chosen what he wanted to do. He could have chosen the choicest land. And what we learned in Genesis, the 13th chapter, is just the opposite, is that Abram gives the choicest land to his young nephew. And he demonstrates that, that all those, that, that, that desire for future and fame and and fortune, all those things, those are always secondary, way below your family and the importance of your family. That's what we learned last week. This week, we deal with this issue of the two kings. And D.L. Moody said it this way in your point to ponder. He said, death may be the king of terrors. Think about this. I would think that none of us would invite death, okay, that we would want to physically die. It is coming unless the Lord Jesus returns uh, before we expire. Each person in this room, myself included, we are going to physically die. Death may be the king of terrors, but here is the good news. But Jesus is the king of kings. Jesus is the one who has conquered the grave. Jesus is the one who is powerful over the wages of sin and death. This is our king. Death may be Something that terrifies us, rightly so. It doesn't sound like a very fun experience to watch people. I have watched people in their last moments many times draw their last breath, and often they are in physical pain. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes the, the doctors have given them enough medicine to kind of kind of you know level off that pain, but often the pain is there. It doesn't look like a great experience. But one thing I do know for all those who are in Christ, the moment that you draw your last breath and you step into eternity, you get to see King Jesus face to face. And he invites you in, as we learned last week from J.I. Packer. Adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven. You and I are forgiven. We're brought in for supper and we're given the family name. Whatever distinction, whatever you want to kind of identify yourself as today, whether it's your ethnic heritage or maybe your wealth or your background or whatever it is, the most important thing about you and I is that we call on the name of Jesus Christ and we are in the family of God. This is good news for us today. And so today we learn about a tale of two kings. We learn about a good king, a righteous king, in fact, not just a good king, but also a wicked king and how Abram is going to kind of deal with these two different individuals in the way that he relates to them. With that in mind, let's turn our attention to the Holy Writ of God. Let's stand in honor of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. And for our guests today, we are blessed that you are here. We are continuing to have some more people join the church. We welcome the, the right hand of fellowship to you, and we invite you in to this fellowship today. We pray that you feel welcome. We pray that you are blessed by the prayer and the fellowship, the music, and the preaching of God's word. We want to say welcome to you if you are a guest. And remember, there's a little slip there in that, that, that uh, pew in front of you. You can just fill that out. Just leave it in your seat. I'll get it. The ushers will get it at the end of the service. But we are blessed that you're here, and I would like to get to know you after the service. You'll give me an opportunity. But let's get to Genesis 14 and let's use verse 18 as kind of our launch off text today. We'll, I'll briefly actually summarize some of the, the information that comes before 18 and following in Genesis 14. But I want you to see this, this interesting character, this fascinating character named Melchizedek is mentioned right here in verse 18 of Genesis, the 14th chapter. This is what the Holy Spirit of God inspired Moses to recall recount all those years ago, not only for the people of God in the ancient world, but for you and I all these years later. Hear the word of God. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the most high God. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest. He was a priest of God, the most high. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we have a righteous king. We have a good king. We have a 
powerful king. We have a king that can work miracles and do amazing things. But along with his power is his righteousness tempered by and led by his holy nature. And Father, thank you for giving us one such as Jesus who is all these things and then some. We are so grateful for your son, Father. Today, right now, I pray that you, as Scotty was praying, remove me. Hide, hide all of us. Hide me behind the cross right now. But, but by, the, by the Holy Spirit, remove me. And I pray that it is the power and the presence and the person of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that will meet with us right now as we lower the microscopic lens on the text of Scripture and by your Spirit, Spirit illuminate our hearts and minds. But don't let it just be in our mind. May it be in our heart. May it be something that we believe. And now it's going to go to our hands. It starts in our head. It goes to our heart. Now it's going to go to our hands. We're going to live out the truth. We need to live out the truth that there is one true king and that one true king is Jesus Christ. None other. No rivals. None beside him. Never has been. Never will be. Father God, may we Learn this truth once again that Jesus has sovereign right over our lives and it is our privilege to serve him today. It is a privilege to serve you, Father. It is a privilege to serve in the power of the Holy Spirit today. May it be so. May it be among your people. Change us. Make us more like your son, Jesus Christ, that we might extol his excellencies all over Oklahoma City and beyond. For the glory and fame of the sovereign monarch, Jesus Christ, the one true king, the king above all kings, the name above all names. It's in that great name we pray all of God's people said. You may be seated. Here's your life point, quickly. Choosing a king determines the kingdom you will inhabit and the legacy that you will leave. To be a king, it denotes and indicates that there is a kingdom. You and I are not kings. There is one true king. That king is Jesus Christ. Choosing a king determines the kingdom you will inhabit and the legacy you will leave. Uh, choose wisely because quite literally your eternity depends on it. There's one king, one way, and one life. Here's the deal, y'all. Your allegiance matters. Who you choose to be your king, it matters. It is the most deci important decision of your life. Which king will you choose? There really are, in the final analysis, there really is just two options for you and I. Number one, the right one, the one true God, the Trinity who reigns forever, this creator God who is intimately involved with you and I as his creatures. This is the one true king. Will you worship him today? The other option is anyone or anything else that would rival in your heart and your mind this one true God. The most important thing we leave behind is actually not who we lead, but who we follow. Let me say that again so it kind of falls on your heart and your head. Think about it. The most important thing we leave behind as Christ followers, it's not actually who we lead, but it's who we are following. If we are following Christ, if our eyes are fixed on Christ, if we are transfixed on Christ, guess what? The people who are following us, they will be doubly blessed. I've seen it in my own life with my own parents, with my own mama and daddy. It is fitting on uh, Mother's Day that I would get to mention my mom and what an impact she has had on my life. I've seen it day in, day out that she really believes in Jesus Christ, the King, and she lives and loves. Her, her whole life is all built around Him. It's all about Him. I saw it in my daddy's life as well. And they left me with a spiritual heritage of the Lord. This is genuine legacy. If there is one thing we could leave behind is, who are you going to follow? That's what I would ask my children. That's what I would remind my wife. Who are you going to follow? Who is your king? In the end, there really is only one king, one way, and one life to get it right. This is the time. Who do you choose to be your sovereign Lord and King? To say that Jesus is not only Savior, but He is Lord, by the way, in the early church that was flipped, it was always Lord and then Savior because quite literally many of the early church Christians, they were martyred for their faith. There are Christians today that are going to be martyred for their faith. 
And it wouldn't surprise me for some of those Christians that are going to be martyred today that they are asked there in the final moments of their life that they are asked to recant their faith in Jesus Christ. You know what? If you just say that Jesus is not Savior, that He's not Lord of your life, that He's not King, we'll let you live. Time and time again throughout the annals of history, we have seen that people will not bow the knee to man. They only bow the knee to the God-man, Jesus Christ. That is my heart, and it must be the heartbeat of this church. Choosing a king determines the kingdom you will inhabit and the legacy you will leave. Choose wisely, friends, because quite literally, your eternity depends on it. Now, before we kind of jump in the text here, I want to set up the scene. I'm just going to kind of, by way of summary, just because... We're running short on time. And I know, I know that all of y'all think that I just preach too short. And so I'm just, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give this a, a, a little bit more time today, okay? Here's the scene. A great battle in total. There are nine kings and nine kingdoms by my count. The most powerful of these kings in the ancient world that is mentioned here in Genesis 14 is Kedor Laomer from Elam. Elam is basically southwest Iran, if we were going to look at a map today, it would be basically in the southwest corner of Iran. And he must be in a very powerful king because he defeated a race of people called the Rephaim. They were often considered to be ancient giants, an ancient society of giants. So this man and his army are very powerful. And he picks up another Mesopotamian king by the, way, uh, by the name of, uh, of Tyre. You can see it there in the first part of Genesis 14. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eleazar, Kedor de Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. So, so what, what, what's going on here is Kedor Laomer, he is, he's a tyrant. And what do tyrants do? They always want to uh, gather more land and resources, and they want to rule over people. That's what we see with that nut job over there in Russia right now. He is trying to take back land that was never his to begin with. He thinks it's his, but that's what tyrants do. And here in the life of Kedor Laomer, we see this spirit of being a tyrant, this spirit of, uh, of overwhelming and overtaking people. Quickly, just a brief geography lesson. The area of the world that we're talking about here is the ancient Near East. In particular, just think in your mind, those of you that have studied kind of the land of Israel and the Holy Land, think of the Sea of Galilee on the north side. And then you have the Jordan River running, running below, running south towards the Dead Sea. And there uh, on either side of the Jordan River, in particular, the west side, which eventually will become known as the West Bank. This is the land that, that God has told, told uh, Abram that he will go and he will inhabit and that his descendants will go and they will take over. Okay, And so you have the Sea of Galilee kind of in the far north there in Israel. And then you have the Jordan River that kind of splits and goes south towards the Dead Sea. And on the west side of the Jordan River, this is kind of the, kind of the, the land, if you will, that is, is under question. That, that these powerful kings of old, that they are vying for. Isn't it interesting that that land today is still being, being vied for? It's still being fought over. You uh, all know me. I'm not much of a politics guy. But one thing I do know about the geopolitical world and this global system that we know called geopo uh, the geopolitical realm, one thing I do know is that Israel is a very, very important place to the one true God. And so you, you better get behind Israel on some things. It doesn't mean you have to understand and, and believe everything that Israel is promoting. Obviously, we know the vast majority of the Israelites, even to this day, have rejected their Messiah. That is not good. That needs to be righted. But this land, this ancient land, this Beulah land, this promised land that God has promised to Abram and his descendants, it is once again under attack. And they're, they're, they're vying for this beautiful land, this land that, see, these great tributaries are flowing right off of the Jordan River, and it created great fertile plains. This is an arid part of the world. Uh, water is in short supply. We would call most of this area of the world, we'd call it the desert. Now, I know here in Oklahoma, we think that our, our red dirt, our burned red dirt, and our, our farm, farm ponds, that's, that's akin to a desert. This is a lot drier than that. And so there's a premium on this land, this West Bank land. And the kings of the Northeast, 
Kedor uh, uh, Laamor and, and, and Tidal and these other kings, they have come down and they have basically demanded tribute of these southern kings along kind of the, the southern part of what would become Israel and certainly the West Bank, this fertile land. And we learned that the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, they are going to be defeated in this fight. We know that Lot was, of course, in the land of Sodom because that's where the choicest land was. And we learn that he suffers for that choice. He suffers greatly over and over because of his own greediness. It's a good reminder for us. When someone gives us the opportunity and they have the power to grant a certain piece of land to us or a certain resource, maybe we shouldn't take the best of it. Just a, a reminder and let that person keep that best in that choicest land or resource. Here in the text today, we see here in Genesis and 14, uh, chapter 14, we see the first mention of the Hebrew. This is the mention of the one that is to, to come out of, the ones that, that, that give passage. You can write down verses 13 and 14 of the text. And now we hear that Abram gets word that his nephew, that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they have been captured. And they are in a bad way by these, these Mesopotamian kings that have come from the northeast, present-day Iran and, and south and Iraq and, and come on down. And they have kind of waged war against all the, the rival kings there around what we know to be the land of Canaan. And so Abram gets 300 of his own men. That's important. The Bible tells us in verse 14 that 300 of his own men, so bigger than this church, more people in this room right now, they were servants to Abram. They were at the beck and call of Abram. And he gathers up 300 of his men and they go. And the raid is successful. The Mesopotamian kings, they lose, essentially. And now we have the situation which kind of brings us to where we're going to land the plan to, uh, plane today regarding the two kings. Abram, after this successful raid, after he gets back Lot, after he kind of frees uh, the, the king of Gomorrah, the king of, of uh, Sodom, they, he gets back their resources, he gets back their people, the Bible tells us. Here in verse 17, look at verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedad or Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. That brings us to where we're going to kind of dig in here regarding a tale of two kings. This is really, to me, the essence, the most important part of this text is Abram's response to these two different kings. The first thing I want you to see from the text today is that there's one king who is worthy of your worship and will. Let me say it again. There is one king who is worthy of your worship and all of your will. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. Verses 18 through 20. The Holy Spirit says this. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, he brought out, he brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. That's very important, by the way. Verse 19, and Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high. Notice the priest is blessing Abram. Abram is there to, 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 to give homage to this great man, this righteous king. And here the king blesses Abram. And the, the king of Salem says that uh, you are the possessor of heaven and earth. Speaking of, speaking of God, the creator, God is the possessor of heaven and earth. Uh, to kind of describe God most high. Verse 20. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tenth of all. Abram gave a tenth or a tithe of all that he had. And so Melchizedek is very clear that the reason that Abram has won this battle, by the way, again, this is not a battle that Abram should have won. This king... Kedor Laomer, he is very gifted. He has already conquered many other societies and many other people groups. He is one of the great kings of old. And yet, Abram takes 300 of his men. I'm guessing not all of them were trained to be fighters. Maybe they were. But God defeats this wicked king. And we see the blessing of Melchizedek on Abram. Now, we learn that Melchizedek, literally his name, Melchi and Zedek, if you take those two words, those two Hebrew words, it speaks of the king who is righteous. 
This is the king who is righteous. No other king is really referred to in the biblical text in such a way. There is something different and something special about this one that we know as Melchizedek. He's a bit of a shadowy figure, but he's a great and grand figure. He's a figure that is important to the economy of God. The Bible tells us that Melchizedek is the king of Salem. Of course, Salem would become eventually known as Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem, the root word in Jerusalem is the word shalom, meaning peace. This is to be a city of peace. And the city of peace is to bless the nations. Remember, we learned that in the Abrahamic covenant in particular... One of the key facets of it is not only that God blesses us, but we are to be a blessing to other people. We love the first one. We're not so good at the second. We need to work on the second. We are blessed, and the reason we are blessed is so that we can bless others. The Bible tells us in other passages that we'll look at here in just a moment that there, quite honestly, is no, quite literally no genealogy for Melchizedek. We're not told anything about his parents. He literally kind of springs up out of nowhere. Think about the Jews and the Hebrews. Think about how how specific they were in developing these very detailed genealogies. And now they're going to call this man. They're going to give homage to this man, this king who is righteous, who for all intents and purposes, we know nothing about his parents. We don't know if he has earthly parents. He sprung out of nowhere, and I think that's honestly the best answer as I see it. I think this is a theophany. I think this is the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see other passages in uh, the Bible that speak to this. But there's no mention of Melchizedek. You remember what it says in Micah of Jesus, of the Messiah. It says that he is from eternity. That there is no, basically there's no age to his days. Okay, there is no age to his days. That's what we see here in Melchizedek. He's just one who is, who has no lineage. He's the only priest in all the Bible. He's the only king in all the Bible. We know that, that David had a heart after God. But this is the only king in all the Bible that explicitly is compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your copy of God's word, turn over to Hebrews chapter 5 real quick. Hebrews 5, I'm just going to read a few verses and we're going to get through this and you're going to be blessed by this because you're going to see that this Melchizedek is a very unique, special individual. In fact, I believe, again, it's the second person of the Trinity who has taken on flesh an Old Testament theophany here. Look at the perfect high priest of Hebrews chapter 5 and we'll read through verse 6. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. That's speaking of the earthly priest. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his sins and for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as it also says in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Look at that. Melchizedek is the only high priest that is compared to Jesus Christ. We know Jesus Christ was without sin. And the only high priest that is mentioned other than the Lord Jesus Christ, that was one without sin because there's this whole argument that we see there in Hebrews 5 about even the priests, they have to give offerings and sacrifices for their own sin. And yet that is not applied to Melchizedek. I think this is the Lord Jesus Christ here in Genesis 14. Look at Psalm 110 real quick. Turn over to Psalm 110. Take your copy of God's Word. I want to hear those pages. You know, it's, it's sad when you can't hear pages turning anymore. I guess everybody's touching their phones and pulling it up on their phones. I wish there would be a... Maybe they need to make a... You know, a little swish sound so you can hear it when you, when you tap it. Look at verses 4 through 6 of Psalm 110. 
Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Doesn't that sound like the Lord Jesus? He will judge among the nations. That is Jesus. He will fill the corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. The vast majority of the world is arrayed against God. And all those who stand against the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, they will unfortunately meet their final fate. But we see that Abram, he blesses Melchizedek back with worship. He makes the volitional choice to say, this is my king. This is a king worthy of serving, worthy of honoring, worthy of devoting my very life to, worthy of devoting my very breath to. All that I have is devoted to this one true king. And so we see that Abram, he gave a tenth of all that he had. And by the way, this is the first mention of the tithe in the Bible. We should be faithful in giving back to God that which is God. And let me just say this. All the resources that you have in your life, they are not yours. They are God's. Every penny in the bank, every car that you own, every house that you have, every title of land that you have, it is all the Lord's. And it is meant to be used for the Lord's resources. Yes, you can enjoy those things, but they ultimately are the Lord's. Abram understands that, and he gave a tenth of all that he had to this king of righteousness, this one known as Melchizedek. There's also another king that is mentioned in this text. It is a wicked king, not a righteous king. We see one king worthy of your work and wealth. We see kind of the other side of it here. We're still going to focus on the positive aspects of Melchizedek, but we're going to see some of the negative aspects and facets of the king of Sodom. Look at verses 21 through 24 to round out the text today. And then the king of Sodom. So kind of the idea here is these two kings walk up to Abram after this successful raid. He has traveled back to his land right there, kind of on the south side of the what today would be the West Bank. This is the Beulah land. He's right there on the cusp of the Canaanite land. And these two kings come out Two kings come out to basically meet him and greet him. And we see very clearly that Abram, he he allows the king of righteousness to address him first. His eyes are on the king of righteousness. Now let's see what happens with the wicked king in verse 21. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. The people of Sodom had been conquered by this other king and they had been taken away. And the king of Sodom, who is now very happy that he has his life, he had fallen into a pit there in the salt plain in the valley of Siddim. And he's very happy to have his life. He says, you know what? You keep all the things, you keep all the resources, but give me back my people. You see, a king needs a people to rule over. Give me the people and take the goods for yourself. Verse 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Yahweh God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. We see Abram raising his hand before the Lord. He is swearing an oath. I have sworn to Yahweh God most high, the one true God, the God who has shared his personal name, the God who has blessed me over and over and blessed my people and saved my people. I swear an oath to him, possessor of heaven and earth. And the the promise is this, the covenant is this, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours least you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Aner, Eskel, and Mamre, let them take their share. So basically, Abram's saying, I don't want anything that you have. All the stuff that you have, king of Sodom, it is tainted with sin. It has been won over by depravity and duplicity means I don't want anything to do with you, says Abram, to this wicked king. Basically, Abram has ignored this wicked king until the worship of the one true king, Melchizedek, the righteous priest, until 
he, uh, Abram and, and, and the righteous priests have had an interaction and had their time. Now he turns and he allows this wicked king to address him. And you see Abram almost just wave him off. No, I don't want to ha- hear you say anything else. I don't need what you have. I don't want what you have. Get out of my life. A strong oath. Abram rebukes Sodom's king. Abram rebukes Sodom's king. What do we learn about the nephew Lot? He hasn't learned a lot. And we're going to see here before long that he is continuing to choose the wrong king. And yet, even in that, God is gracious. You and I, we're not promised tomorrow, by the way. Which king do you serve? Whose eyes, uh, you know, whose eyeline are you looking at? Are you looking at the eyeline of Jesus? Or are you serving some other man-made false pagan god? You say, Brother Ryan, I don't bow down to totem poles. I don't, I don't run around a tree. Okay, but is money the Lord of your life? Is that relationship with a, a significant other, is that more important to you than the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ? Maybe that job that you have, you think, you know what? I would literally die if I didn't have this job. You know, I love this job. I'm grateful to be the pastor here. And as long as y'all will have me, I'm grateful for that. But I don't have to always be here. I just have to preach the word of God and die. Okay? It is the same for your life. Don't ever put your stock in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your work and all of your wealth is worthy of the one true king. Your worship, your will, your work, your wealth, basically your life. Everything about your life, your worship, your volitional will, your wealth and your work, it's all about Christ. He is at the center. We swirl around him and there is nothing else. The quicker that we understand that, the quicker that this church can move forward and once again be a beacon of light for this community. We see glimpses of it here and there. We see glimpses of the Lord moving and we're grateful for that. But we need to all have our eyes on Jesus. We sang it earlier. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. When you turn your eyes upon Jesus, you are basically saying, this is the Lord that I love. This is the life I'm going to live. This is the legacy I'm going to leave. It's all about the king. And let me tell you something all. There there, there is no other king. There is not any other earthly president or any other ruler that has come close to the one true king, Jesus Christ. And when he returns and he rules and reigns for a thousand years from Jerusalem, we will know and we will see and we will not doubt any longer. I long for that day. But until that time, may our faith be our true sight. May we see Jesus even though we don't see him incarnated here in the flesh this morning. He's not standing before us, but by his spirit and the truth of his word, he is with us. May we turn our eyes to the one true king. Sing that with me one more time. As Alan and Winan come up for our time of invitation. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm going to ask you to stand right now during our time of invitation. Perhaps it's time for you to get right and real before the Lord. And you need to acknowledge that the one true king has not been the king of your life. Okay? You have known the Lord a long time and you realize you are giving your heart, you are giving your resources, you are giving your time to anything but the one true king. Today is the day of repentance. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ in a real, genuine relationship, you can honestly say, He's not my king, I don't know Him, but I want to. Call on the name of Jesus Christ right now. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus Christ, His shed blood on the cross of Calvary for your sins and the sins of all the world. And on the third day, the Bible tells us He rose again according to the scripture you're going to commit and confess your whole life as a witness to king jesus 
If we have some others in here today and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you came in here today, you say, I don't know anything about this place. This, this place has a crazy preacher, but I like it. I want to be a part of that church. You come and you extend the right hand of fellowship and we'll extend it right back and we'll invite you to the family of God. Sing right now as we go before the Lord. Let this be a time of repentance.